Um, before I begin, I want to mention one other item. Um, Crop Walk, uh, Church World Service is the larger organization behind Crop Walk. And they do very similar work to ADRA. Could you bring it down some more, please? Um, in providing water, uh, shelter, um, animals to uh, families overseas so they can have self-sustaining instead of animals that they would eat and be done with, animals that produce milk or eggs um, so that they could continue to sustain themselves and even sell some to bring in money for the family. Um, we are going to be supporting um, the Crop Walk, and we're going to be doing something for ADRA later in the year. Crop Walk is an opportunity because it's well known to get out there and mingle with fellow Christians and with the community, let them know that we are a fellow Christian entity if they don't know that, and then invite them to participate with us in the fall for ADRA as well. So it's a great opportunity to rub shoulders with fellow believers. It's the 27th at 1 p.m., Sunday the 27th at 1 p.m., to walk around either. Um, there's some going a part of way and back. Others are doing a full lap around Lake Hollingsworth. And um, if you would like to um, be a point person, develop a team um, to collect uh, either walkers who would participate by bringing an offering with them, or in the past they got donations uh, to sponsor the uh, walk itself. However, you would like to be involved, can't not be in kit, raise your hand back there, see them. There'll be a, a paper that you can fill out here. You can actually go online and create uh, a page as well. And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, a good number of walkers for that event as well as in the fall. Yes, Kathy. We are registered with the Crop Walk. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so if you're signing up, uh, whether you get one of these uh, forms or you do it otherwise, see Kathy so she can kind of take record. We're looking to get about 20 people. Um, there is a request for all walkers throughout Lakeland that are going to this event to bring canned food with them that day. All of that canned food that is brought will go to our food pantry. And so um, that way they're contributing to help our local ministry as well as we're contributing for the larger Christian work around the world. That having been said, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer in preparation for the preaching of his word. Father God, thank you for your word, the Bible. Thank you for each one here today that has been drawn by your spirit, whether in person or online. <clears throat> it is no accident that we are here. Uh, some may feel that they were compelled by human forces, but others of us know that human forces are sometimes used to do godly business and that you are behind all good things. And we thank you for those that are able to hear this message today, uh, whether in this service, whether at home, whether today on your Sabbath day or at some other time, for this is such an important message. It is a message that is foundational to everything else that comes out of uh, our experience with the Bible and our experience in the church. For it is the foundation of your word itself, inspiration. Help us to understand what it is, how it works, and um, to be able to have that knowledge impact our lives for good, for salvation, for today, and for eternity. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, this morning, uh, the message is a long one, long title. Um, I've broken it up. It may be a three-parter. It's at least two parts at this point, as I haven't finished uh, it yet in my study, but I've got part one done today. Why are there so many different Bible translations, and how can we know the true message of God for humanity? That's an important topic. We haven't dealt with that since I've been here, not directly, um, but it's an important one because this year, I'm asking that all of you, whether here in person or at home, and if you are at home, I would like to get a copy of this uh, Bible that we're reading through. It's an outreach designed, uh, soft cover, Christian standard Bible. It's one of the newer versions um, in English. And uh, we're reading together as a common reading source. It's not designed to be a study Bible, but a reading Bible. 
and we can talk about differences of that uh, if you'd like to see me afterwards. Um, there are references and stuff like that we'll talk about probably next week as we try to unpackage our end of this inspiration question. How do we then interpret inspiration? How do we understand it? What Bible should we be reading? How should we be reading it? That'll be next week. This week, we're going to deal with the source itself that came to the original uh, prophets in Hebrew, in uh, Aramaic, and in Greek. Can we trust it? Where does it come from? How does this whole inspiration thing work? That's today's topic. And so um, let's begin. And I want to go to the next slide, please. Our main text, our primary text for this topic is 2 Timothy 3, 16. Uh, you heard Elder Tom read it. Uh, earlier this morning, it comes from page 1025 in uh, the CSB um, Outreach Bible that uh, we made available. So let's go to 1025 <clears throat> and then look for 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. And in this case, I'm just going to focus on one part of that verse today. Um, you will probably notice, those of you who are Bible students, the more you study, the more you know, the more you realize today that for the sake of time, I'm going to have to leave out. But I'm focusing on that which hopefully will draw people into further study, and that which, we, which, which will be the heart of the message that I believe God would have us all to, to know and hear today, the message that certainly he's placed upon my heart. And uh, here is the main scripture. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable, and then it goes on to say, for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, for training in righteousness. All scripture is inspired by God. Let's go to the next slide. So we have different ways that that is written, depending on your translation. If you have the King James or New King James, you will notice that it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you have the Greek, you'll find that given by the inspiration of God, is um, translated as divinely breathed. If you have the NIV, they seek to translate that into English by using the phrase God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. If you have the CSB, which we read from uh, just a second ago, a couple seconds ago, uh, it says all scripture is inspired by God. Are they different? Do they disagree in the detail of the word? Of course they do because we are translating from a different language. And yet, do they all mean the same thing? Yes, of course they do. Um, we have to be careful when we're talking about inspiration that we don't focus too nitty gritty on the precise words in every situation. As a matter of fact, not only the precise uh, words uh, as were described here, but sometimes numbers and names are different when we look at English translations. How is that? We're going to look at that a little bit more, but let's just first of all start with the source. Scripture, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is divinely breathed. Um, let's look at the next slide, and I hope I don't have a duplicate here. Next slide should say, I should have a, yeah, there you go, thank you. So God is the source of scripture. According to 2 Timothy 3.16, God has breathed on men, and they have received something, a revealing from God concerning himself and humanity. Revelation uses that word because it is a book of revealing about God and revealing about God and his Messiah, Christ, in the context of end times. So inspiration has to do with God revealing himself to humanity, and he does that through individuals that he selects. Next slide. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we learn that God breathed on the writers of the scripture before they wrote. Then, some personal communication during that time that he breathed on them, um, some personal communication is conveyed from God to the individual. But the individual has a language, has a context, has a culture, which is the only thing they know. If God spoke to them in God's language and disrespected the person he was speaking to, they could be totally clueless. Just imagine how many of you, if you were uh, spoken to 
um, in a, a language that is not your own would be clueless. And so God doesn't speak in the language of angels in heaven. He speaks to, to men who speak Hebrew in Hebrew. If you pray to God in English or Spanish, you might think, hey, God speaks Spanish. That's what I've heard some Spanish people tell me is going to be spoken in heaven because God has always understood their prayers. God understands my prayers in English as well. God understands the prayers of every single person in the world in their language. And that's how God speaks to us, too, in the language that we have. We have to then unpackage what God has given to the, the prophet, the person he's speaking to. They have to unpackage that and express it in the context of their language and their culture for the people of their time so that they will understand what God has given to the prophet to share. Next slide. Now, some Christians believe that God inspired the person. That's what I've been talking about. But others uh, believe that God inspired the pen or the words of scripture, that he chose every word that was written. Um, and uh, that's what was in the original scrolls. And that changes everything. We talk about study. Then you're talking about, wow, does my Bible have the right words? And this has affected some of us in uh, preferring the King James, which has been around for a long time. And some of the newer translations are suspect because wait a minute, those words are, are different. Uh, the older words must be better because if God gave them, why should anybody change them? Now, here's hopefully no new news for you, but here's something to consider. What language, what words did God choose to have the Bible written in when it was originally written uh, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Hebrew? Oops, that's going to cut a lot of us out, me included. I've taken Hebrew. I studied it. I got through the class. I can't read it today. I use the Bible helps that you use to understand the words. I haven't kept the language up. So we all have to read a translation. Any translation, as you know, will never have the word that's being translated. Well, maybe I shouldn't say never, but it won't have often the same word. Sometimes you have several words to unpackage that one word because you're translating. God oversees all of that. God oversees the message that he gave to the prophet as it is conveyed both in the prophet's language to his people and is translated into other languages for other people like you and I. And so we must be careful not to be focused on the singular words as they appear side by side, but on the combination of those words which produce a message and that God has overseen. Now, what does Seventh-day Adventists believe about this whole process of inspiration? Is it the pen? Is it the person? I'd like you to look at the next uh, slide. And this is where I'm going to ask you to use your handouts. Hopefully everybody has one of these. Um, it's about three pages long, actually six pages if you go front and back. And I've marked it up so we can hopefully as quickly as possible go through it. But I really want you to have this information. This is my preaching as a teacher this morning. I want to do some teaching here, and hopefully we can all benefit either for the first time, or you might be empowered through this to share with a friend or family member about inspiration as we seek to read the Bible together this year, <clears throat> and as you seek to discuss and study with others this year. So this, first of all, is called Issues on Revelation and Inspiration. It was written a number of years ago by Angel Manuel Rodriguez who is uh, or was at that time one of the uh, members of the Biblical Research Institute. And uh, they are the official body of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that addresses uh, biblical questions that people have, doctrinal issues that people have. And he has written this up to help us as church members deal with this issue. So I'll start with number one, what I've marked as number one, the topic of Revelation and the inspiration of the Bible has become a central theological issue among Adventist theologians and many interested church members. The significance of the topic cannot be exaggerated since it places on the table <clears throat> for analysis that from which we derive our uh, message and our lifestyle. Consequently, 
the way we understand revelation and inspiration, that is to say the very nature of the Bible uh, we're talking about here will have a direct effect on our faith and practice and on the role of the interpreter. So can you understand the importance of this message today is if we read the Bible differently, we're going to un understand it in, in very different ways. We can't even be a united people if we come to it from a different perspective. If some trust it as God's word and others uh, only take it as fables um, or men's perspective about some uh, experience they had that wasn't uh, given to them in a specific uh, way that it, there was no content, it was just an experience, and there are some that hold that view, then there's no trustworthy, reliable word of God for us to even uh, align ourselves around. So we need to look at this and understand uh, what exactly is revelation and inspiration, what, it, what we have here in between these pages we call the Bible. Let's look at number two. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> studies made on the history of revelation inspiration in the Adventist church have indicated that our pioneers simply took for granted the traditional protestant view of verbal inspiration that the topic began but the topic began to be seriously addressed after 1882 Let's pause there just a minute. Don't be surprised that our church was not always taught or believed the same thing. This is true in a lot of areas. In the very beginning, Ellen White, a prophetess to our church, did not accept the truth about the Sabbath. Oh, what does it matter? Sunday, Saturday. She had been a Sunday keeper in the past. And then it took time for her to come to understand and accept that. Same was true about pork. She enjoyed pork as a younger woman, and there was a period of time when she thought, oh, pork's okay, it's not, you know, that big of a thing, until she grew in her faith, as you and I hopefully are doing day by day, and came to understand that God's word instructs us with principles of health, of which the pig or pork is not part of the healthiest diet that we can eat, and are not a part of God's plan for his people, amongst other Levitical uh, laws and instructions to us. By the way, those political laws, I remember hearing a, a sermon series up in Ohio on, I think it was a Moody radio station, where a man was, um, a pastor was presenting to uh, the Christian public uh, these great understandings about health that he discovered from Leviticus and, and in the Old Testament. And I thought, how interesting, we've been accused as Adventists of being legalistic um, and the Old Testament being done away with. And here was this great revelation uh, and praise God for it, of now the health laws being beneficial to us and how much science now backs up a lot of those things. <clears throat> and this is a kind of thing that we need to be aware of, that all of us don't grow at the same speed. And that all of us in any given moment don't agree, perhaps. But we need to pray that God will show us and reveal to us and understand that oftentimes truth is progressive. I don't mean progressive in the political sense, you know, conservative, progressive, liberal. I mean, in the sense that it progresses, it moves forward. It doesn't stay still. It continues to grow in our minds. It grows in our uh, lifestyle. And so we need to understand that and give grace to one another when we have Bible study issues and we don't agree on a point. Love the individual. Don't make agreement the reason to love or hate someone. Love the individual, punto, period. And continue to pray and study. Maybe you'll be changed. Maybe they'll be changed, but we will progress in the direction of truth, not error, as men and women and young people of God. Back to number two. Subsequent discussions of the topic or the subject indicate that the church was feeling uncomfortable with verbal inspiration. That is the Seventh-day Adventist church. And other options were explored, such as the theory of degrees of inspiration, uh, that was proposed by George I. Butler. This theory was soon rejected. And an indication of the direction of the church and that it would be headed was found in the general conference statement made in conjunction with the revision of the Book of Testimonies to the Church by Ellen G. White, in which it was stated, quote, we believe, referring to the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, we believe the light given by God 
to his servants is by the enlightenment of the mind, thus imparting the thought, and not, exception, except in rare cases, the very words in which the ideas should be expressed. This view came to be known as thought inspiration. So the point being made here is that God did not dictate, at least we Adventists came to believe that that was the case. Um, I certainly have come to that point in my own um, study and experience with God. And I hope that you will at least address that if you're not there already and consider it, that God inspired the person, but not every single word. Number three is an important one. We're going to reference here Ellen White. And she made it clear that never she never believed in verbal inspiration, uh, according to the research that was done on her writings and her comments. She simply indicated, you'll see it underlined there, that revelation operates on the whole person, infusing the human mind with divine thoughts. Uh, I even experienced this somewhat, and perhaps you have too, when you prayed, when you studied. Uh, have you ever had a, a, a dream or an insight, uh, whether out of study or as you were sleeping or having meditation time alone with the Lord at the riverside or maybe near some mountains or someplace that was peaceful and quiet? You had this, uh, this thought, this impression, and it felt like it was a great insight to you but you didn't have the words to express it to someone else. Have you ever had that happen? Now imagine if God was selecting you with a message and he gave you this revelation, this revealing of himself. It was had content in it and words and, and you understood it yourself, but it was so challenging uh, perhaps for you to be able to put, or for the prophet, I should say, you're going to put into words. The next prayer would be, then God help me. And every pastor that I know of Praise this prayer. I can tell you, I do. Help me, Lord, to say what you want me to say this week. Help me to put it down in a way and preach it in a way that is received by the congregation, that they hear you speaking to them, that they understand the truth you want me to convey, and not my words, and not my teaching, but your teaching. That is a part of the process. Number four. However, the social theological context of the Adventist church in North America directly contributed to the promotion of verbal inspiration. We have to face the facts of history that we haven't always been um, on the same side, certainly we can say that, of what we believed, and we haven't always been on the side of what I would say we understand today as truth. Sometimes we've agreed with fellow Christians when they've been in the wrong, like Ellen White, who initially agreed with her church upbringing about Sunday, until she became convicted about Sabbath being Saturday. So in their struggles, Adventists in their struggles against modernism, um, evangelicals, the greater Christian community, promoted verbal inspiration. The temptation, and we gave into it largely, was to follow suit with evangelicalism and to also believe in verbal inspiration. However, the 1919 Bible Conference held in Washington, D.C. in July 1 through 21 of 1919, and, and you ought to do some research on that. You can look it up online. Um, there's lots of material available. That conference is eye-opening. We struggled with a number of things uh, during that conference as a church. Uh, it indicated that Adventists were divided on the topic. We've been divided on other topics over time. We haven't always agreed, but we continue to wrestle knowing that God will cause us to persevere. God will lead us as a church into all truth, as long as we don't demand we're right and somebody else is wrong, but that God's word is right and that prayer is the connection between us and God and humility by which we can come to understand God's word in a common way. Um, that is the goal of every Christian uh, congregation and certainly of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, um, let's see. During the first half, if you look on at the bottom of the page here, four lines up, during the first half of the 20th century, the prevailing theory was that verbal inspiration was uh, what we have in Scripture. But by the 1950s, thought inspiration was beginning to become a main position in the church. 
this is a period of time in the church when other controversies early on uh, were also held, like salvation and where the law. We talked about that this morning. We're talking about that, but we go through Hebrews. Um, the idea that you had to keep the law to be saved versus salvation by faith. Uh, that also was a growing thing in the church, and still we have people on both sides of that, uh, just um, both sides of that position, as well as there are people on both sides of this position in the church still today. I want to challenge you to study it again. Number four, second half on page three, the first edition of the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia from 1966 stated that, quote, we do not believe in verbal inspiration according to the usual meaning of the term, but in what may properly be called thought inspiration, end quote. Now, when it says we, that, of course, is talking about the leaders of the church who have been given the task of speaking on behalf of the church. That doesn't mean all of us agree with that. That means that's what, where the church is. And the church, uh, as an entity, is seeking to be led by God and has even changed our fundamental beliefs over time. I don't know if you're aware of that. We haven't always had 28. We've had different numbers of fundamental beliefs over the time period of our church, as in the preamble or the first paragraph to our fundamental beliefs states, you can expect that these fundamental beliefs will be changed at any time that the Holy Spirit allows the whole church to come to agreement upon a better way to state these truths or a deeper understanding of these truths because we seek to be a spirit-led movement and congregation that is based upon the word of God and will change as necessary to speak this word better or more clearly, as opposed to having some creed from early on that we are held to and can't change. We don't have that in the Adventist church. This is our creed. There are non-Adventists and ex-Adventists who claim the 28 fundamental beliefs is our creed. Couldn't be a creed because it's not been the same. It's changed. A creed doesn't change. This is our unchangeable creed as Seventh-day Adventists. Number five, page three. Fundamental belief number one tries to address this idea of inspiration in saying this. This is our first belief of our 28. And uh, this comes out of the 1980 General Conference session, which approved the statement, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God, given by divine inspiration through holy men of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this word, God has committed to man the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the authoritative revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history, end quote. This statement establishes through the use of biblical language that the Bible is of divine origin and that God was involved in the process of transmitting and recording the divine revelation. It avoids the phrase thought inspiration so as not to perhaps um, cause unnecessary confusion, uh, where some use that in a different way, as well as avoiding the idea that the very words of the Bible were dictated by the spirit to the prophet. In spite of that fact, the idea that thought inspiration, um, in spite of the fact that thought inspiration is not explicitly mentioned in the fundamental belief number one, it has become, it has become the predominant view among Adventists. If you go all the way to the bottom of the page, the text that we used earlier, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, I put a star there in mine after I printed yours, but it's at the bottom of page four, you'll see 2 Timothy 3.16 and 1 Peter 1.20. Let's go to that page, and that you'll find is page 1047 in your CS. B, Krishna Standard Bible uh, version. Give you a second to get there. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Here we go. Above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. 
Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there is a definite um, work that begins with God and is um, organized or overseen by God in conveying truth to the prophet or the individual uh, who is given the task to write it down and pass it down to us today as the Bible. If you look at page five, Ella White made this comment um, a number of years ago. It is uh, referenced. Um, you can look at the reference. Let me see. I better refer to it because I don't think I copied you. It is from first selected messages, page 21, also manuscript 24, 1886. And here's what she writes. It's on page five of the handout. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired, she writes. Inspire, inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. Thus, this is my words now, thus if you uh, speak Hebrew, your um, revelation from God is going to be expressed in Hebrew, not in Greek or in English or in Spanish. And that is what we have in scripture. Let's go back to the text. She says the divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus, the utterances of the man are the word of God. Now, that may take some time to pray over uh, and think about and discuss, but do that. Um, it's very um, challenging for those who have the idea of word inspiration instead of thought inspiration. Um, another text on number seven, on the final page, page six, she writes, although I am as dependent upon the spirit of the Lord in writing my views as I am in receiving them, yet the words I employ, says Ellen White, in describing what I have seen are my own, unless they are those spoken to me by an angel, which I always enclose in marks of quotation. That reference is from First Selected Messages, page 37. Uh, also, it's a uh, similar thing is written in Third Selected Messages, page 48, where she says, I am just as dependent upon the spirit of the Lord in relating or writing the vision as in having the vision. And the final thing I wanted to share with you is in number eight. Um, the process of revelation and inspiration reaches the words, even though the words themselves are not inspired. So it's not to say that God doesn't have an influence over the words, but he just doesn't dictate them. That is to say, they do not represent the divine language per se, and neither were they dictated by the Spirit. However, the Spirit guided the prophets in the writing process in the sense that the Spirit made sure that the prophets used the best of their abilities and their own vocabulary to express the message they received in a trustworthy and reliable form. Ellen G. White suggests that possibility when she comments that there were times when she was not certain of how to express herself after having a vision and she's wanting to put this down on paper. She wasn't sure how to express herself with what she had uh, received from the Lord. And then she says, quote, the appropriate words, end quote, came to mind. And you can find that reference uh, in First messages, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot my abbreviations. For those of you who know them or can look them up, it's first MCP. Do you remember what that one is? I forgot as well. But one MCP, page 318. Let's go to the next uh, slide, please. So what are we talking about here? The first Bible truth, and there's going to be one Bible truth for each of my parts in this series, 
So for today, Bible truth number one, God inspired the individual, not the pen. That is the current Seventh-day Adventist church teaching. It is certainly where I stand, and it will make a difference in everything with next week as to how we deal with the interpretations of scripture, the translations, I should say, of scripture, and how to study the Bible when we have so many different translations. How do we find truth? When do we become concerned? Oh, that's not the word in my Bible. All of that is related to this first foundation that God inspired the individual and not the pen. And um, so God gave authors a vision you'll find in scripture, sometimes a dream, Sometimes it was an experience. He used history and people's lives in the Bible to communicate divine knowledge to the biblical author in some fashion. Then the individual communicated that inspiration, that truth, that message from God in the author's own words, from his own education level, using his own language, culture, and experience, guided, of course, by the Holy Spirit, through which to communicate God's message to his audience. And then, of course, for us, since it wasn't given in English, we've had translators that had to then take that and put it from the Hebrew, from the Aramaic, from the Greek, into English or Spanish or whatever your preferred language is. And God oversaw it all so that truth, not error, was conveyed. And that's the main point. If we don't read so minutely and detailed that we find all these conflicts if we back up a little bit and see the whole forest and not get caught up in the trees we will find that god's truth is discoverable in every translation now there are some paraphrases that cause some problems i'm talking about translations we'll talk about that a little bit more next week there is even a, a pastor that i was told years ago who made Adventist bible studies and use the Catholic Bible to do it. If our Bible, if our truth, if our doctrine necessitates a certain Bible, we've got a problem. Adventist truth doesn't need an Adventist Bible. It can come from any Bible because it's truth and because God has protected it. Amen? And so that needs to be foundational. We don't need a certain Bible any Bible will convey God's truth because he has protected it through time, not in the specific words or the translation, but in the message that those words together convey, it is irrefutable and it is understandable. Here are some examples of how inspiration has worked in the Bible. Next slide, please. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Again, if you have the version you most trust, uh, for some, that is the King James. Um, you can find it there. You can look it up in the Christian Standard Bible in, on page 882. And if you read, let's, let's, let's just look at it together, 882. You have yours, so you can look at it in whatever translation you prefer if you um, are more comfortable. But I'm going to read it from the Christian Standard Bible, 882. 882. There we go. Now, this is how Luke, Luke is a gospel writer. Luke, we don't usually call him a prophet, but we certainly call him inspired. He is, has written the inspired text of the gospel of Luke that is in our Bible, has been accepted by the church across denominations as trustworthy record, um, as given by God, as saved and preserved in the Bible for us to benefit from throughout all time until Jesus returns. And he says this about his inspiration. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that I have been, uh, that have been fulfilled among us. This is Luke 1, verse 1 and following. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us, so I also, uh, sorry, so it also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you an orderly account or an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Now, what is, how is he describing his 
inspiration, his experience with inspiration, God giving him uh, and directing him to write this gospel. He says, it seemed good to me. Let that settle for an instance. The prophet doesn't always convey God gave me a dream, God gave me a vision, God gave me these exact words. He says, God moved through my thinking and through my research and through what I have collected about Jesus, and he has inspired me to give it to my friend Theophilus and for all of us, an orderly account of things that he knows to be true for the sake of those who will follow after him. That's a part of how inspiration works. It doesn't always produce all the material. That's what he's saying here. What I'm writing in my book isn't all from me. It's from other sources that I've collected, and I've compiled it as these are the trustworthy, orderly things about Jesus, and I've cut out the other things. He says a lot of people have written, but I have written one that you can trust, my friend Theophilus. And so a part of Revelation and this is important, inspiration and revelation, not only for Bible study, but for using Ellen White, our church's prophet or voice of God to our denomination. If we think that God dictated the words, we'll have trouble when she instructs her, um, her copyist to rewrite some of her books as she, had done, done, as she did. We'll have trouble when a new printing comes out and the words are changed. Because we'll think, wait a minute, those original words were inspired. No, she was inspired. That never changed. And the inspired person said, you know what? The way I worded that and the way it has been read by people in a misreading way, um, I need to write that in a different way to convey more with more um, clarity God's message and, and cause less stumbling blocks for people who've read that wrong. And so she authorized the rewriting of a number of her books for that very purpose. That's how inspiration works. Let's go to the next slide. Another example of this <clears throat> is found in the Old Testament uh, in the book of Psalms. Or for those of you who see each Psalm as a separate writing, which it was, the book of Psalms, um, each one being a psalm, having its own number. Now, we've always attributed that to David, right? But are you aware that David did not write all those psalms? At least scripture does not record that he wrote all those psalms. According to um, gotquestions.org, which you can go and check out online, uh, David is attributed in scripture as writing or authoring about 75 of the 150 psalms. So what did David do under the power of inspiration? God led him which psalms to incorporate, which ones to use. Now, this also can be helpful with those accusations that come about on the White's writings. Well, we found that she's copied this from other people. A prophet, uh, an inspired person, does not need to be the originator of every word as long as it is truth and conveys God's message, he may lead that prophet to compile other people's writings that were perhaps inspired by God as well. Certainly they convey God's message truthfully and without error. And those are, move, those are God moves the prophet to incorporate those into the writing that then the prophet uh, autographs or puts their name on as trustworthy and reliable. Next slide. Another example. Um, oh, I just gave that one. Yeah, from Ellen White. Next slide, excuse me. Let's read 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22 for another example from Scripture. 2 Timothy. Let's see what page is that? 1025 in the CSB, 1025. And we're, we're getting there to, to the end, guys. Uh, thank you for your patience. I just want to make sure that we got through this material today. It's foundational to what's coming next. Um, 1025. 10. Ten twenty-five. Almost there. Ten twenty-five, and it is Second Timothy 
chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. <clears throat> We're at the bottom of 1025, and in the CSB, you'll find verse 9. Make every effort to come to me soon, says Paul to Timothy, because Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world, world and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. <clears throat> Bring Mark with you, he writes to Timothy, <clears throat> for he is useful to me in the ministry. And he goes on to talk about personal issues all the way to the benediction. Greet Priscilla and Aquila <clears throat> and the household of Onesimus. Uh, when is there, I'm not going to try that again. I, I failed that one twice. You can see it there in the text. Um, Erastus has remained at Corinth, and he goes on to give personal notes. This is all a part of inspired word, but is this God dictating to him to give greetings? God doesn't dictate his word, but he inspires the prophet who gives the message and sometimes adds on personal notes to the people he's writing to. Ellen White did the same thing, and um, it is a part of, again, the idea of how inspiration works, how God works with humanity to convey his message, and how we as human beings take that message and sometimes incorporate um, aspects which are personal um, in relation to our ministry to it, as here Paul did with Timothy. Next slide, there's only two left. Some people ask, why are there even word differences between the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek translations that are out there? Are you aware of that? There are some people, I think, uh, I've gotten the impression from the way that conversations are had and points are made, that there is an entire Hebrew scripture out there, an entire uh, Greek New Testament out there, and that um, the King James has found it, and has translated it faithfully. Unfortunately, that's not true. If you do any serious biblical research um, on the, the texts, there's no original texts. The original texts were written on papyrus, on paper. What happens when you leave paper outside for a long time? It rains on it, sun comes out, it deteriorates, it becomes nothing. They were not written on stone like the Ten Commandments. They're written on papyrus. Now, fortunately, through time, there have been copies of the original that have been saved and protected because they've been intentionally done so, because they've been buried, because of certain circumstances that God overseeing it has brought down to us trustworthy records. But it's just not the original words. It's the original message, but not the original words. So how was the original then saved? Well, I visited a, uh, a gentleman in the town of Samaria. We went to uh, the town of Samaria for the Passover sacrifice, Passover service or sacrifice when we were in Israel. And it was a wonderful experience to be with this town as they celebrated the Passover and they killed the goats. I won't get into the way that happens. You can read it in scripture and drain them and uh, took out the entrails and all the things that were instructed in scripture. And they included the children with that on their first one, they would get marked on the forehead. And the priest, the head priest of that community, <clears throat> somewhere in the midst of this service said, hey, hey, come up to my house, I want to show you something. And we walked out of that uh, area where all the people in town had gathered uh, into the town and up to his house. And he brought us into his um, small and humble living room. And he went out into another room and came down the hall and he showed us a handwritten copy of one of the books of scripture. I don't remember which one it was now, but he had hand copied from some text that he had gotten his hands on. So now he had his own portion of the Bible in his home. And we would look at that and say, I've got the whole Bible in any language I want on this little cell phone. But when there weren't copy machines, and there weren't cell phones to take a picture of it, and there wasn't a printing press, which is when the Bible was written, the only way to get a copy, you couldn't take it out of the library and get a loan on it. Mm -mm. And there was no complete set. There was scriptures here and scriptures there. Is when you became 
when you came into contact with scripture, you could ask the priest or the individual, can I write a copy of it? Then people were also instructed by the priests or the churches or the synagogues to write copies to send to other churches or synagogues. And it wasn't until many years later, hundreds of years later, that we were able to actually set up a printing press or take a photocopy or a camera shot of the exact words of any text and make sure it was unchanged to the next generation. Now, that may cause some people to fear, oh, errors. God guided that process in the same way he guided the prophet in the beginning. Does that mean it was perfect on the minute level? No, it's very evident that there are numbers that are different when you count numbers of people in Old Testament um, um, census, censuses that were taken, names of people and birth records, they sometimes differ. Words differ. Uh, I don't think we dealt with the text from the experience that Jesus had with the demoniacs. Or was it demoniac? If you know your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. There are two records, records of that event. In one place, Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee, comes out of the boat, and he is confronted by a singular demoniac. In another recording, he is confronted by two demoniacs. It's the same event. Now, some people have sought to make it two different events to deal with that problem. But others have said, no, it's the same event. But obviously, or maybe not obviously, but, but what is understood is that one of those demoniacs was the spokesperson. The other one was kind of quiet. So he wasn't important to the story. He wasn't important to the message. It wasn't important to the truth God wanted to convey that you, you said, oh, by the way, there was another one there. The truth was conveyed without mentioning both demoniacs by one, and the truth was conveyed mentioning both demoniacs to another. And if you listen to the way that we tell stories, you notice that some people are very detail-oriented, and they'll mention every detail, even the not important ones. And other people will cut right to the message impact, and they'll miss some of the details. God gets his message across through all of this. He's protected his truth through all the copying, through all the translations, so that what we have today is trustworthy if we will read it and if we will study it. And that's the biggest issue, and I'm going to end on that note today. Let's go to the final slide. So once more, Bible truth for today is this. God inspired the... Thank you. I say it again. God inspired the individual, not the pen, not the word, the individual. And God oversees it all so that his truth gets conveyed. However, if we don't read it, practically, it doesn't matter that it's truth. It doesn't matter that he protected it. It doesn't matter which one is more reliable to ask about that. If we're not reading anything, it's not going to get to us anyway. Does that make sense? So if we believe that God has inspired men to give us a message that is salvific and that is central to our life here on earth and eternity thereafter, then the first task for us to do is to trust what we've already read from Timothy, that God inspired men and moved them to give us this word for teaching and for instruction in righteousness, and that we then need to read it so that we can be instructed, so that we receive that teaching, so that we can learn about salvation. And if we're not doing that, it doesn't matter what we talked about today. But if what we talked about today is true, then the way to take this truth that God has given us and protected and make it applicable effective in our lives is to read this into our minds so that God can work it out through our lives. So I pray that you will be a reader of God's word this year, whether you join me in my Bible reading plan or you use another. Let's read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, which we're going to do with the Bible plan I have. Uh, we're going to go back and forth to the Old and New Testament so it doesn't get you know, too bogged down in some of the Old Testament reading. We're going to read back and forth. And let's this year all go through the Bible together again, or for the first time in 2022. And if that's your commitment, I want to ask you to stand on a prayer for you that God will make sure that nothing 
Satanism, throw anything in the way that will keep you from getting that done this year. If he gets you off track one day, he'll get you back on the next. If you miss reading one week, he'll get you back on the next. But this year, we'll read the Bible through together so that God can activate his inspired work through our minds and through our lives and bring transformation and change. Anybody want that? <laughs> I could use some transformation and change. If you will join me in reading God's word, this trustworthy uh, record, stand with me and I would like to pray with you. Do the same at home. Stand with me. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to have to look. If you can't stand, raise your hand. That's standing up with your hand. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for inspiring men of old to record what we have today, not in the identical words that we have, certainly our own language uh, causes difference there, but Father God, in the content of the message, it is true, it is faithful, it was given by you, it has been protected by you, through all the fires that sought to destroy your word, through all the uh, insults against it, and the false doctrines and teachings and heresies, you have protected your truth and brought it to us today. And next week, we're going to talk, or not next week, but next time together, in two weeks, we're going to talk about what we can do to access your truth and to access it in a faithful way in spite of the various numbers of translations that are out there. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll help us as we navigate from trusting the source to trusting the process of incorporating your truth into our lives. I pray that you will guide that entirely and that our part would be Every day to get up and say, today I'm going to read something from your word. Every day, let that be our commitment. And at the end of this year, we will have made progress. And I thank you in Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for those that stood to commit to reading God's word today. And may God bless and keep you as you go from this place. If you need Bibles or up front, if you need handouts, come see me. If you need a Bible reading plan, they also should be up here. And next week, Elder Earnhardt will be here. Elder uh, William Earnhardt from the Plant City Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's the head elder over there and our Bible worker. He will have the message next week. And then I'll be back with you in two weeks. And we're going to deal with part two of this series. God bless you.